Mr. Oberon Padmore. Thank you very much, members of the panel and friends, that this symposium or a similar symposium is not taking place or has not yet taken, taken place in Trinidad and Tobago is an indication that the job of education and self-awareness still remains to be completed. Today's symposium is celebrating the 50th anniversary of the publication of Dr. Eric Williams' seminal work, Capitalism and Slavery, is by its purpose an acknowledgement of the man as scholar and the enduring relevance of this work. The very fact that 50 years later, the book's thesis and the inferences that he has drawn from it continue to attract much scholarly attention is a powerful tribute to the integrity of the foundation upon which Dr. Williams built. An important aspect of Dr. Williams's work was the profound challenge it mounted to the traditional Eurocentric perspective on the issues of capitalism and slavery and the highlighting of the important and often unacknowledged contribution of the non-European peoples to European and world development. As that other outstanding Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean man of letters, C.L.R. James wrote, capitalism and slavery is not only West Indian history, it cleared up a lot of rubbish in English history. In asking me to focus on Eric Williams's political career, I wish to make the point that the scholar turned statesman and politician came from a radically different mold. Dr. Williams did not enter upon his new challenge empty-minded or as the typical colonial political aspirant. Dr. Williams brought with him a clear intellectual perspective and conviction about governance and its moral role in society. He was clear in his mind as to the type of society which he conceived it to be his mission to assist in bringing into being. This perspective and conviction were rooted in Dr. Williams's deep study of history and his work at the Caribbean Commission, both of which enabled him to develop a thorough knowledge and understanding of the problems of West Indian economy and society. Immediately upon his separation from the Caribbean Commission, he entered the political arena. He did so in dramatic fashion and in a manner which had the effect of firmly establishing his credentials with people crying out for leadership. Dr. Williams obviously saw himself as destined to lead an independence movement for Trinidad and Tobago and indeed the entire Caribbean. On the very evening of his departure from the commission, June 21, 1955, he commenced an address to an appreciative audience of some 10,000 Woodford Square, the University of Woodford Square with these words, and I quote from Dr. Williams then, I stand before you here tonight, and therefore before the people of the British West Indies, the representative of a principle, a cause, and a defeat. The principle is the principle of intellectual freedom. The cause is the cause of the West Indian people. The defeat is the defeat of the policy of appointing local men to high office. It was an arresting start, and Dr. Williams commanded his audience's undivided attention for the next two hours. He ended that address in a most stirring fashion. I was born here, he said, and here I stay, with the people of Trinidad and Tobago, who educated me free of charge for nine years at Queen's Royal College and five years at Oxford, who have made me whatever I am, and who have been or might be at any time the victims of the very pressures which I have been fighting against for 12 years. I am going to let my bucket where I am, right here with you in the British West Indies. It was a spine tingling moment, something new in the politics of Trinidad and Tobago. A people, one can almost say a lost people, 
found a leader and the leader followers. The recognition was instinctive and immediate. Study and work experience determined what was to be Dr. Williams's goal and that of the movement, the People's National Movement, he was so instrumental in founding. To build a united and democratic society. To achieve this, they first had to destroy what was perceived to be a rotten colonial inheritance of inequality and the exploitation to which it gave rise, pernicious social divisions based on race and color, the continuing existence of which at a time of greater self-awareness can be a cause for social instability, and the role of governments which under colonialism entrenched an order which served the interests of a privileged minority, but which was inimical to the best interests of the broad masses of the population. Dr. Williams's stated goals determined who his political opponents would be, those who were the principal beneficiaries of the then prevailing exclusionary order. He was attacked mercilessly in the press, from the pulpit, and by, and by big business. How did Dr. Williams approach the task of implementing his goal of a new Trinidad and Tobago society? Through the electoral process, Dr. Williams was a committed Democrat. He had an abiding faith and confidence in the great masses of the West Indian people. The PNM founded in January 1956 was able to form the government nine months later after its first attempt at the polls. The party and its political leader were able to generate a wave of national fervor, a sense of a new dawn. The PNM won 13 of the 24 seats contested. Given the composition of the colonial, legislator with an, of the colonial legislature with a non-elected element of two ex officio senior colonial civil servants and five members nominated by the governor, the PNM's electoral success was not beyond challenge. However, in the face of the party's insistence and the, and the concern of the colonial office, not to appear to be frustrating the wish of the electorate, the non-elected system was modified. The ex officio members would give the government their full support, one of the, of the, and of the five nominated members, the PNM would nominate two, and the governor would consult with the PNM's leader with respect to the appointment of the other three. And so a stable government came into being reflecting the new nationalist awakening which Dr. Williams and the PNM introduced to Trinidad and Tobago politics. In successive constitutional changes, Dr. Williams became chief minister, premier, and the prime minister. The country became a republic in 1976. Dr. Williams successfully led his party in five general elections and remained at the helm for 25 uninterrupted years until his death on March 29, 1981. His longevity was assured by his sagacious and dynamic leadership which enabled people and party to remain in communion with each other over an extended period, despite the concerted and ultimately vain effort of many to sever the bond and the policies embraced by successive administrations, policies which were seen by the people to be in their interest. Dr. Williams sought to use the leverage of politics to address the historic problems of the Caribbean, of which he was acutely aware on account of his own scholastic research. In, these, in this brief contribution, one can only offer some examples. Racism was anathema to him. Slavery, he said, was not born of racism. Rather, racism was the consequence of slavery, and unfree labor in the New World came in all colors. White racism, directed at blacks and people of mixed color based on the theory and the practice of their inferiority survived the abolition of slavery. To Dr. Williams, racial equality was part of the larger world struggle for freedom and as he wrote, the Negro will not achieve moral status until he achieves economic and political status. However, Dr. Williams chose to enter politics through the instrumentality of a national movement, the PNM, 
made up of all the races, creeds, and classes of Trinidad and Tobago. This was in recognition of the fact that the various groups all suffered together, and therefore only together could they succeed in building a society, a nation, and a homeland, his words. And hence his oft-quoted and euphonic ad admonition, there can be no mother India, there can be no mother Africa, the only mother we recognize is Mother Trinidad and Tobago, and mother cannot discriminate between her children. All must be equal in her eyes. Education, opportunity, and constitutional arrangements ensuring impartiality in the conduct of public affairs were policy initiatives to combat racism in successive Williams administrations. The point needs to be stressed that no particular policy measure had a single purpose. Equal access to expanding educational opportunities, which struck at the root of discrimination, also produced a larger number of better educated citizens and with it a labor force better equipped to participate more productively in the country's development. Dr. Williams also sought to use active politics to address the historic issue of metropolitan domination of the Caribbean. We shall cite the cases of, Sh of Shagaramas and the Federation as examples of stepping stones towards the region's escape from such domination. Dr. Williams's effort with Shagaramas succeeded where his effort over Federation failed. The principal regional protagonist involved with Shagaramas was the government of Trinidad and Tobago, with the federal government playing a much less decisive role and indeed incurring the distrust and, sus and suspicion of the government of Trinidad and Tobago. The conflict over Shagaramas raised the historic issue. Does it remain as a base and continue to reflect the ascendancy of metropolitan interests? Or is it released to become the federal capital, thereby according priority to the emerging Caribbean nation? As Dr. Williams wrote in pursuance of his campaign for Shagaramas, my speeches were a forthright defense of the rights and interests of Trinidad and Tobago. On this occasion, the emerging nationalism prevailed. Federation produced an entirely different outcome. Dr. Williams argued cogently and strenuously for independence and a strong federation. Quote him, for us, it was the very life of the federation which was at stake. Independence meant the turning of the minds and ideas of the West Indies from London and the colonial office, which had hitherto been our center, to the federal capital, where the politics and economics of the West Indies would be decided. It was through such a political medium also that we of the West Indies would be able to unite ourselves. Dr. Williams speaking. There were fundamental differences in the approaches of the member states. The protagonists did not believe strongly enough in the idea of greater strength through unity. In the final analysis, the centrifugal forces overpowered the centripetal ones. The Federation collapsed. Fragmentation then, as now, remained the order of the day. Dr. Williams's economic nationalism grew out of his study of Caribbean history. The very thesis of capitalism and slavery is an assertion of how the wealth generated by slavery, the slave trade, and monopoly provided the capital which financed the Industrial Revolution. As industrial capitalism matured, it eventually destroyed the slave trade, the slave system. In essence, Williams, the scholar, maintained that the wealth generated by slavery and the plantation was not used to develop the West Indies where most of it was created. Williams, the politician, wanted to reverse this perverse pattern. West Indian resources must contribute to the development of the West Indies not to its underdevelopment. This determination was exemplified in his policies of seeking through the state in the absence of a dynamic local entrepreneurial class to control the commanding heights of the economy. 
This was not a unique approach to development. It was to be found in Western Europe and many parts of the developing world. Trinidad and Tobago was and is a modest oil producing country. Its public finances got a substantial boost in the 70s following the Arab-Israeli war, when there were several sharp increases in oil prices and new oil discoveries came on stream. These gave rise to significant surpluses. It opened to the people of Trinidad and Tobago the hitherto denied opportunity for industrial development on their own terms and using locally their own hydrocarbon resources. Speaking at a sod turning ceremony starting the construction of a state iron and steel complex on a new industrial estate, Point Lisas, carved out of sugar lands, Dr. Williams said, here at Point Lisas, sugar gives way to wire rods. Instead of exporting all our gas, we dedicate an increasing quantity to our own indigenous development. Williams, the political leader, was always deeply influenced by Williams, the scholar. But the pragmatism required in the practice of democratic politics often appeared to conflict with the purity and idealism of the scholar. Inevitably, longevity in office took its toll. Close colleagues fell by the wayside. There was industrial upheaval in the 60s as the effect of a, slow, of a slowing economy began to take hold. Strong labor legislation described as anti-worker by the unsympathetic was enacted to contain escalating illegal work stoppages. The black, the black power movement, an expression of black discontent in the society, reached a climax in 1970. It was an extension of a surge of black consciousness which was then sweeping the United States. What happens here eventually washes up on our shores. This manifestation was complicated by a revolt by a disgruntled group of army officers. The government declared a state of emergency, imposed a curfew, and was eventually able to contain the situation. All of this was done with utmost respect and regard for the country's constitution and its laws. Dr. Williams, by way of direct response to this new challenge, presented a Shagaramas Declaration, Perspectives for the New Society. In this, he acknowledged that the task of reconstruction required the country to do more than it had already done. It needed to go beyond the self-government and independence, expanded educational opportunities, emphasis on the small man, etc. The West Indian people needed to acquire economic as well as political power and share equitably in its benefits to make their own, and share equitably in its benefits and make their own culture. The oil revenues of the 70s gave a fillip to this thrust. In a short presentation, we can only use the broadest of brushes to paint a picture of Dr. Williams's political career. He himself, in what turned out to be his swan song, as if he had a premonition of the imminence of his own mortality, offered his own evaluation. His address to a party convention and the party stewardship, 1956 to 1980, was virtually an account of his own stewardship. The results were mixed. Dependence and fragmentation were still depressingly evident. He feared that space for the small man was rapidly being preempted. There were internal enemies, those who were against the emergence of a truly multiracial society, those who absolved themselves of all responsibility for the state of society, placing all the blame squarely on the government. Those with problem attitudes who demanded efficiency in output but remained personally indifferent to the quality of their input. On the positive side remains the society's commitment to democracy, its support for the forging of a genuine partnership between the state and its citizens in the ownership of economic activities and our natural resources, while at the same time encouraging the enterprising to pursue their own goals. An ever-changing world has now moved far beyond these perspectives. Globalization and rapid technological change, together with the role of multinational financial institutions, have fettered the capacity of governments to be change agents in the manner contemplated by Dr. Williams. Yet, his has been a powerful and positive legacy for Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. By his example, Dr. Williams has demonstrated that leadership matters that knowledge and its timely dissemination can be crucial in exerting influence and achieving success, size notwithstanding. He had the right perspective for a society yearning to cast off its debilitating shackles, 
but in relation to the monumental job that needed to be done, his time among us was too short. But we who are left must resolve to extend his example. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Padmore.